Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. I think there are one or two people still taking their seats at the back, but uh, let's get started with this uh, second uh, session because we've got a lot of, of business to get through. Um, my name is Neil Buckley. I'm the Eastern Europe editor of the Financial Times, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Dragon Capital for uh, inviting me again to uh, moderate this uh, second panel this morning. It's the uh, third year in succession that I've had uh, the pleasure of doing this. Uh, and I have to say, um, of course, enormous changes have happened in the country since then. Uh, and a big change I notice here doing this panel is uh, two years ago, the first time I did this, there were no government ministers that day. They, uh, if I remember rightly, they'd called a cabinet meeting and there were no ministers. This morning, uh, Natalie wants to say That could that. happen any minute now, so be uh, careful. <laughs> we're, hope, we're hoping it won't, uh, uh, because I was going to say that uh, we are due to have no less than five ministers. We've got three already. Two are arriving uh, fairly shortly, God willing. Um, so I think that's a, um, a demonstration of uh, you know, the commitment of this uh, government to uh, the process of reform to communication with people like uh, yourselves um, and quite a, uh, quite a sea change in, in attitudes in this government. Let me briefly introduce uh, the ministers we already have uh, on the panel. Uh, to my uh, immediate left is uh, Natalie Yuresko, the uh, Minister of Finance. Uh, she's a Ukrainian-American who worked at the U.S. State Department and later at the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, uh, then worked for um, Western NIS Enterprise Fund, a U.S. government-funded private equity fund. And then finally, she was co-founder and CEO of Horizon Capital, uh, a private equity fund manager uh, specializing in Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova. So someone who knows this market from the inside as an investor and has a very good understanding of the challenges. Um, next along, to my left, your right, uh, is Alexei Pavlenko, who is the Minister of uh, Agrarian Policy and Food. Uh, he has a business background as a former deputy CEO of Foxtrot, the electronics retailer, and CEO of Rise, which is a group of farming companies. Uh, uh, he was lately on the supervisory board of European Dairy Technologies. And then uh, on the end, at the moment, uh, Andriy Pivovarsky, who is the Minister of Infrastructure, uh, who I think will be known uh, to many of you as a former um, uh, Director of Dragon Capital, uh, then served as uh, CEO at Continuum, uh, the business group whose assets include one of the largest filling station chains in Ukraine. Uh, so I should note another important difference uh, between these ministers and, and some of the pa those in the past is none of them have been ministers before uh, uh, and may never be again, says Natalie quietly off <laughs> microphone uh, here. Um, two of them, one of those already present, uh, were not Ukrainian uh, nationals before taking up this job, so that's a very unusual situation uh, as well. Let me start, though, with uh, Natalie Yuresko. Oh, no, actually, let me take over one or two small pieces of admin, first of all. This panel will finish at 12 o'clock, earlier than it says in your program, uh, because we need to get on with uh, the next set of meetings at that point. Uh, there will also be, at two points during this session, uh, audience voting on questions, as there was in the first uh, panel. So uh, I'll announce to you when that's going to take place. Uh, you won't be voting on the performance of the ministers this morning. I should make that um, uh, clear, but on broader questions. Uh, so do keep your uh, little voting handsets, uh, these things, to hand. And if you haven't got one, uh, they've got them at the back. But let me move straight on and talk to um, Natalie Uresco, first of all, uh, as Minister of Finance. Uh, Thomas Fiala, when he opened the session this morning, said that the timing was very fortuitous, given that uh, we just had a new uh, IMF deal, uh, at least given staff approval uh, for Ukraine last week. Um, so let me ask you, first of all, about that, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in the audience. 
This is different in form from what Ukraine got last year. Last year was a, was a standby arrangement. This year is, a, is an EFF, an extended financing facility. What, what are the main differences between the two and what, what, what's the reason for what's the reason for this EFF as opposed to an SBA this time? So thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to be here today in front of all of you and thank all of you for coming to Ukraine at this uh, very important time. Um, from my perspective, and there is a representative of the IMF in the room, you can ask their perspective. From my perspective, what's important about having an EFF is that it is a longer term program. It's a recognition on the part of the Ukrainian government that the challenges that we face are not short term challenges the needs that we have are not short-term needs, and that this is going to be a complex and deep and medium-term program of reform. No one is fooling themselves as to the complexity of the challenges that we face and the complexity of uh, resolving the problems that we face. At the same time, an EFF also, uh, my understanding, gives us access to deeper resources. And um, the program that's been approved at a staff level and by our government in principle is $17.5 billion U.S. dollars over four years, um, which as a percentage to GDP is one of the largest IMF programs in history. Um, now that's not from my perspective saying uh, everything because uh, GDP was uh, declined because of devaluation, not necessarily a terribly uh, critical um, number to compare it against. It is not the largest on a per capita basis. It is not the largest. Uh, from many other perspectives, but for Ukraine and given the way the IMF uh, looks at these programs, it gave us access to deeper resources over a longer period of time. I think the last thing I'll say is I would hope that both the business community and our partners in the international community, and here comes the Minister of Economy, um, I hope they will understand that what this means is that I believe you can have more confidence and there's more credibility in the program that we're, that we're adopting. That, that program is the Ukrainian government's program. Yes, we negotiated with the IMF about uh, benchmarks, about timing, about order, about perhaps um, the, 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 the nature of each and every one of the reforms, but the program is ours. And having a medium-term program I think is important for Ukraine given its previous track records of having IMF programs that perhaps in the past were not fully implemented. This is a market change. Last year's standby was implemented. All of the benchmarks, all of the uh, prior actions were, uh, were, were met with the exception of some of the, the, the targeted end of year numbers. But all of the reforms were in, in fact implemented. And here we've taken on an even greater set of, um, of responsibilities as a government. Just talk us through um, how this is made up, though. It's 17 and a half billion from the IMF. You've got uh, a couple of billion uh, in loan guarantees from the US, uh, just over a couple of billion dollars from the EU. Uh, there'll be a bit, I understand, from the World Bank, uh, EBRD. Um, but there was talk, Christine Lagarde spoke of uh, 40 billion total, which I understand is over the whole four-year term, um, but where, where, is, where is the rest of that coming from? Some, some are uh, looking at these numbers and saying, well, that looks like there's, you're looking to get a lot from bondholders. Uh, Anders Osland, who I'm sure you know, wrote in the FT this morning, uh, the Ukrainian government hopes to uh, get relief from bondholders of about $14 billion. So is that right? Could you walk us through the numbers? Um, the numbers are, are simple and complicated at the same time, uh, and I think I want to make clear to everyone that the 40 is a number that we see today, but the 40 is not uh, the end all a number. And, and the reason I say that is because it includes a four year IMF program, so the 17 and a half is over four years, but it includes one, one and a half year bilateral and multilateral support from the World Bank, the United States, the EU. I would not expect that to be the end of the support that we receive from our partners during that same four-year period. And yes, it does include up to $15 billion expected from the debt operations that we will begin after the IMF approves the EFF in, in, in full. Could you just talk us through how that um, debt operation is, go, is going to work? Uh, what, what's, what's the timing? What's the process of that? I think you, uh, you already have appointed uh, Lazard to uh, advise on that. Is that right? 
Yes, we, we are working with our advisors, Lazard and White and Case on the legal side. We've hired our advisors and it is our intention, the plan is to first approve, uh, first commit the government to its prior actions, complete all the prior actions that we have committed to in, in the document. Once the prior actions have been fulfilled, and I'm very hopeful, uh, we'll meet later this afternoon with the Parliament to discuss this, but I'm very hopeful we'll do that in a special session next week. Then we can look for a board meeting at, of the IMF to approve the program in final. Uh, once that is approved in final, we will both get hopefully our first tranche the first week of March as well, uh, as begin consultations officially with all of our uh, sovereign credit holders. So I think the timing is end of the first week of March, potentially early the second week of March. $15 billion sounds like a lot uh, to be looking for from uh, debt holders. Uh, how confident are you that you can achieve this and that uh, you will be able to reach an agreement on that, that kind of figure? Yeah, I'm confident that our, our, credit, our creditors understand the situation in the country, that they uh, have a common interest, as we do, in finding a solution, in finding one that uh, serves all of our needs and, in the end, is good for Ukraine and enables Ukraine to both uh, stay in the IMF program, uh, commit to these reforms, and uh, come back to being a, uh, a, good, a good creditor, a good, excuse me, a, a good um, borrower. The day will come when we'll be a good creditor as well. But <laughs> let's, let's, let's take it one step at a time. <laughs> one step at a time. What about the, uh, the $3 billion Russian bond? Uh, what's, what's the status of that? Have you had any indications from Moscow of what their plans are? Is, is that going to be part of the uh, restructuring process? It, it, it is indeed part of our sovereign uh, debt, and we will be treating all of our creditors on, a, on an equ equivalent and equal basis, so we expect to meet with all of our creditors. We are currently uh, current on all of our debt obligations, and we don't have any official notices of anything other than that. So I look forward to meeting with all of our creditors when, when we begin these consultations. And have you had any indication from Moscow as yet as to what their um, plans are regarding that bond? We have had no official communications on that part, no. Okay. So we wait and see. Um, now, this program uh, is uh, predicated, I believe, on a, uh, an amended budget, which will have to be uh, passed before the deal gets board approval next month. I, I understand there was a cabinet meeting at the weekend, is that right, on uh, amended budget? Uh, perhaps you could just talk us through um, what the assumptions are in that, what are you looking at in terms of new uh, revenue boosting measures and uh, measures to curb spending? Uh, the changes to the budget that we've uh, submitted as of yesterday officially to the, to the Parliament are, are uh, significant in, in two, two ways really. Um, one is that we are providing for a significantly increased amount of subsidies for those parts of our population that will be facing that need as we continue to increase tariffs to an economically viable uh, level. So we have increased subsidies by 12.5 billion hryvnia in the budget. That's on top of the existing subsidies that were already foreseen in the budget of 11.9. Um, so that 12.5 is the largest, um, one of the largest components of an increase in expenditures. Uh, that's met on the other side by a revenue mechanism where we can, uh, can pay for these subsidies, and that is by increasing the royalties on our domestic state-owned uh, gas companies, uh, in particular, Ukrhaz Dubovanya. So there is a revenue increase of approximately the same amount, slightly less, in order to balance off the ad additional subsidies. And, and, and in essence, this is taking something from off-balance sheet onto the, ba onto the balance sheet of, of the country, because we had been previously subsidizing this anyway through subsidies to Naknaftohaz, our state oil and gas company. Uh, and in, in essence, what we're trying to do is take the subsidies out from the state-owned enterprise. It's part of the state-owned enterprise reform, larger program that I'm sure Ivers will talk about, and instead provide these subsidies in a much more transparent fashion to those who are truly in need, uh, to the individuals in society rather than to the state-owned enterprise. In addition to this block of changes to the budget, 
There is also a block of changes that relates directly to the uh, change, ex expected change in the, in the exchange rate. So there's a wide variety of both pluses and minuses in the budget that come about from an expected exchange rate that is, is different than what we had in the original 2015 budget. Um, there are expenditures that just increase in nominal hrivnya terms and there are revenues uh, based on VAT of imports and other things that nominally increase. So we actually see in this budget um, those changes are, are the two primary sets. There is also some uh, tinkering or some changes in the level of profit sharing that we will be getting from the central bank as compared to what we adopted in 2015. And also we've reversed any expected uh, benefit from reprofiling of our sovereign debt in the central bank at this time. So on balance, on balance, it's actually a slight increase in the deficit which IMF kindly uh, allowed us to do given the very unique circumstances and because, in essence, again, it's, it's uh, going from nafta gas where it's not typically in the budget to the budget. It's not a true change in our uh, public expenditures. So we, we're increasing the, the budget deficit by 12.6 billion hrivnya, um, and it's, uh, it's based on a slightly new uh, nominal GDP number uh, which is uh, $1,850,000,000. Again, it's slight changes. It is based on a new average exchange rate for the, for the year, uh, which the forecast is 21.7, uh, and on a higher level inflation. As you saw in January, we're already experiencing higher inflation, given that we know we'll be increasing communal tariffs or tariffs for household gas. We know that the, the level of, of inflation this year will be higher. So the changes are not... Um, Huge. I guess I should mention one set of expenditures that we did cut, very important. We've begun the process of trying to balance our pension fund deficit, and I think it's important to note here that this is a matter not only of macroeconomic value, where we reduce the deficit, therefore, you know, theoretically re reducing inflation as we move forward and, and the deficit uh, in the future, but it's also an, an, an issue of justice. Uh, in this case, we focused just in this budget on reducing the pension for working pensioners. And uh, to start the, the changes necessary to make more of an equivalent or just system with so-called special pensions. Many of you know that there are a variety of categories of special pensions, individuals who retire much earlier than the average citizen does with a much smaller um, number of years in service required. So we begin a process of starting to equalize uh, in, the, in those pension areas. So there is a, a savings to the budget written in the changes that reflects this beginning of pension reform. But the larger IMF program requires us, and we are uh, committed to do a greater deal of reforms in each of these areas as we move forward. This is just the first step of many, I believe, that we'll be taking in the course of the next year, two years. And just very quickly, in terms of uh, percentages of GDP then, the budget deficit last year was what in the end, and what is it you're targeting for this year in terms of percentage of GDP? Um, on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a state budget level, I think it was 4.6% last year, and the target right now is 4.1%. Um, but again, when, when you read the press, typically what you see is that combined with the Naftohaz. Last year, we, we uh, financed almost $100 billion in addition uh, for Naftohaz, and this year, we foresee a budget deficit uh, financed by the state of... Um, 29.7 billion, uh, so much reduced, reduced but to a third of, of what it was, uh, in fact, last year. So on, on balance, it's a significant change in public spending. What about the possibility of bank recapitalization, though, and uh, that, that uh, increasing the budget deficit as well this year? Again, for, for whatever sets of... Uh, uh, philosophical reasons, that's not directly in the budget deficit, so you don't see that in those numbers. Uh, we have increased, I can't recall the number specifically, slightly the, the f forecast for our bank recapitalization for this year. That goes primarily, just to be clear, uh, to DGF, to our deposits, uh, deposit guarantee fund, uh, which is in, in, in the process of um, paying out the guaranteed portions of uh, our physical persons or individuals' deposits. So that number does go up, uh, but it's not, practically speaking, a bank recapitalization. So that, that, that term is used, but really it's not, the bulk of that money is not going to banks being recapitalized. That's something the central bank does, not the, the, the state. Um, what we're doing is helping to finance uh, the deposit guarantee fund. 
Let me just ask you one final question because I want to move on and bring in some of the other ministers who, who are here. But just uh, in broad terms, are you satisfied that this uh, program is enough to restore investor confidence and to uh, tame and end capital flight? I mean, we saw outflows uh, in portfolio funds last year and loans and bonds and deposits, um, FDI uh, dwindling to a pretty small net figure. Uh, so clearly there, there has been significant capital flight in the last year. Is this, uh, is this going to be enough to start to reverse that? I certainly hope so. I, I think that to some extent the markets have overshot uh, the expectations of what was possible and what was expected and what is needed. And so I ask you to step back from the brink. Uh, many of the market uh, documentation has said that this is less than what we needed. It's uh, not soon enough. It's not enough. And I, I would argue that this is a, a significant sum of money at a very important time. Uh, if we receive the first tranche, and I will argue that, yes, the first tranche, and in general, the program needs to be front-loaded into 2015. In general, in 2015, the amounts need to be front-loaded into the first and early tranches. But that said, I do believe that the support that we've received is sufficient to restore confidence, assuming all other things being equal, and those things are somewhat out of mind in your control. Um, but I would hope that we can rebuild the central bank reserves, we can rebuild the confidence in the system, we can restore a system where our, our population has confidence again in the banking system. It's not only built on these issues, and I think that's another important thing, is it's not just an IMF program. It's also our anti-corruption efforts. It's actually that the population of this country uh, can believe that our new general prosecutor is actually putting people in jail, Th those things are very important for our civil society. They're not only symbolic, they're something that they're waiting for to see real and true change here. So I think it's a combination of the package, but it's also what we do. It's also what our colleagues in uh, the law enforcement agencies do. I think the creation of the Anti-Corruption Bureau is critically important. The, the new head of it will be cr critically important for credibility, but not just policies and agencies and laws, but actually the reforms, and in this case, actually people being prosecuted is critical for our population, but I would guess uh, for the investment, uh, investment community as well. Uh, the, the, the last thing I'll say on, on build, rebuilding confidence is that um, we are doing a great deal with my colleagues in the central bank to restore confidence in the banking system, and I think that's a critical part of this. Part is the national bank reserves, but part of it is also the uh, set of legislation that's been uh, submitted by the president already to move forward on um, limiting related party transactions, but also not only limiting them, identifying them properly and limiting them, but also then, again, prosecuting those who may have been involved uh, in fraud or in criminal activity that has, in effect, then resulted in a bank failing. That's something that I think society, again, needs to have belief and credibility that they can trust the remaining banks, the remaining banks that are strong, that are standing, that have not engaged in those types of practices. And so I think, I think the credibility and confidence is something we all need to work together to, to build. Uh, we have our role to play. Uh, the central bank has its role to play. Uh, the law enforcement agencies have a role to play. It's, it's, it's not one single package of, of financial support. It's a whole um, environment of change. <clears throat> ah, some applause.